to chase the boys around to see who I would like. But now I chase the girls around, I'm a dyke. God, it feels good to say that. For once in your life, to say who you are. I have to be secretive, uh, so to speak, because there's a kind of an overwhelming fear about homosexuality that I grew up with. Who wants to be queer? You know, it's a fate worse than death. I thought that lesbians were kind of seedy women who wore dark tights and, and whose fathers or husbands beat them. Men automatically say, well, it's because you haven't been with a good man. You know, you haven't let one do it to you. Lesbians are invisible because they're, first of all, because they're women. And women are more invisible than men because women do not have the power in this society that men do. Lesbians first aroused attention 2,600 years ago through the poet Sappho, who lived on the Greek island of Lesbos. Her lyrical writings expressed a sensual love for women. And today, women continue to express this love for one another, although their lives and stories have been shrouded by prejudice and a male-dominated society, so that the majority of lesbians have remained invisible. Today, more and more lesbians are stepping out from the background and assuming prominent roles in business and government, emerging as a political force to be reckoned with. An estimated 55,000 lesbians live in the San Francisco Bay Area, plus thousands who remain uncounted. Tonight, we'll meet five women from this invisible minority. I used to chase the boys around to see who I would like, but now I chase the girls around. I'm a dyke. Oh, do you know how good it feels to say that? I have been waiting 30 years to say that. Pat Bond, an actress, comedian, and writer whose talents have earned her national recognition in film and television. Her monologue offers unique lesbian humor. Mistake number 1,842. I joined the Women's Army Corps. Well, my mother took me down to the recruiting place at the Black Hawk Hotel. She could hardly wait to get rid of me. <laughs> Who needs a queer kid in Davenport, Iowa, in the 40s? No, I was charging up roses on your account to send to some nun. No, no. So I joined, and I walked into Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, with my suitcases and my little dress my mother had stuck me in. And I heard a voice from one of the barracks windows saying, Good God, Elizabeth, here comes another one. <laughs> And I walked into the mess hall, and there were 350 women sitting around in fatigues with little Abner boots with their feet up on the table saying, hey, Henry, pass the salt. I was in heaven. It was the right place. And I met my best friend, Bunny, in the army. Bunny was about six feet two. And she walked like this. But she smoked cigars. And she talked really low. And she shaved every morning. But Bunny did not know she was a dyke. Pat's performance also includes her not-so-humorous experiences in the Army. She describes a lesbian witch hunt, comparing it to the recent U.S. Navy discharges of alleged lesbians. And she gives this advice to other women. It was a terrible time. And I'd like to like, ask any women in the audience who are considering going into the military, don't. They don't want you. They hate you. They will drag you into the dirt. They will help ruin your life. Any minority group, I think, has an in kind of humor that keeps you going. That somehow, if you can't beat them, laugh at it. Okay. Laugh at yourself. Laugh at every minority group I know of has this kind of humor going. And I think without my humor, uh, I wouldn't have survived it. The painful things with me that stand out, one of them was, uh, with my mother, I'm an only child, and I didn't see my mother for 25 years. And that was terrible, you know. It, it meant that I don't know my mother, she doesn't know me, and now she's 81, it's too late, she never will know me. I can never go home again. And that happened to a lot of gays my age. Now more and more young people are telling their parents so that they can stay close. And, but that wasn't possible in my era. 
And then I worked for California Blue Shield. And the boss called me in one day and he said, you know, you're so unattractive that when you walk into a room, people are appalled by your presence. And he said, there's also something here in your record, in my personnel folder, that you are probably a lesbian and I don't even want to talk about that. And I said, well, why have you got it in there? He wouldn't even let me see it. And I really, that still sticks out in my mind. If I ever see that man again, <laughs> I should have at the time thrown a chair at him. I should have, it was, it was being verbally raped. And uh, because I somehow wanted that job so badly to pay the rent, to, I couldn't say anything. And I've regretted it ever since. And I just hope he's seen a few of the things I've done. <laughs> right if you're out there. <laughs> San Francisco's Valencia Street has taken on a new look, that of a women's community for both straight and gay females. Women staked their claim to this low-rent neighborhood three years ago, and now businesses have sprouted along a six-block area between 17th and 23rd Streets. A bar disco, bookstore, bathhouse. The women's building is the nucleus of the community housing a variety of nonprofit organizations and serving as a referral center for all women. Several blocks away is the Artemis Society, the first and only women's cafe in the Bay Area. Owner Sarah Lewinstein is one of the pioneers in this community, opening her doors to customers three and a half years ago. The reason that I had started the Artemis was for women having an alternative space to go to, rather than just going to the bars we're a women's community. It doesn't matter whether you're gay or whether you're straight. This is a women's community. And there needs to be alternative spaces where you can feel free enough to come in and not be hassled by men, not to have a glass of wine and not be picked up. And believe me, I've been in that scene a long time, and I know it happens. I think women are struggling. There's a long way to go. There always will be, as long as women are trying to have business. I see it as a long struggle. Women don't have the money and the backing that men do. There is such a difference. You go to Castro Street, and you see all these gay men's places. Every place you go to is a gay men's bar. On a weekend, it's so packed you can't get in. You don't have the same thing. and You don't see so many women's bars. Sarah is living with Lindy, her lover of three and a half years. Lindy's a marriage counselor who recently returned to school to get a degree in women's athletics. Sarah and Lindy are content in their relationship, but are frustrated by people's prejudices. What's hard for me is, is to feel that Sarah and I have such a nice relationship. I mean, we both live very busy lives, and yet, you know, we spend enough, we have a, a great amount of intimacy in our relationship, a, great deal of support and love and we fight of course we fight and we argue but we get through it so to feel that I have such a healthy relationship and then to feel that that's not recognized or accepted by so many people that so many people still feel that this is something dirty that this is something awful I feel oppressed when I'm in public because I'm a very affectionate person and there's lots of times, you know, and I just want to take Sarah and just put my arm around her or hold hands walking down the street. Uh, and I feel, I don't feel free to do that. The traditional butch femme masculine feminine roles do not exist for Sarah and Lindy and are becoming less common in most lesbian relationships. Sarah and Lindy share overlapping roles. In the course of the relationship, certain things have happened, and um, you know we've evolved roles. Like we were sort of joking around the other day. It some, seems it's when we're up in the uh, snow. For some reason, I have been given the role of getting out and changing the chains. And you know, I get out and it's freezing cold, and I'm putting on these chains. And Sarah's in the car going, "Hi, honey." <laughs> you know, and she's all warm. And uh, but uh, on the other hand, you know, up at our up at our cabin, you know, Sarah will do a lot of the plumbing stuff because I started out doing it and I just didn't like doing it. She just sort of took over doing it. So, and that's one of the things that I really like. I like that give and take. Um, when I was in relationships with men, I just had a lot of trouble with the roles. Bringing the mate home for a nod of approval created mixed reactions from Sarah and Lindy's parents. My family loves me and they'll 
They love. I've been I've been gay for about ten years, and so to see that I've been with Lindy for three and a half years, it's longer than any of them have been with their wives or husbands. They're all divorced. My family doesn't like it at all. It's about the one thing in my life that they have not been able to accept, and I. I used to think they would accept it, and at this point, I don't know if they ever will. Um, I'm real close with my family, and that's been probably the biggest pain in my life about being gay is their inability to accept me and to accept Sarah. Since family is important to Sarah and Lindy, they plan to co-parent a child by artificial insemination, adoption, or having a male friend father the baby. They are concerned about a male role model. It's true that, that middle America or a lot of America is used to the nuclear family and that is how you bring up your children with a mother and a father. And we're seeing now a huge trend away from that. We don't know how this is going to affect the kids. We won't know for at least another generation. Um, we both feel it's important to have men in our child's life, if it's a girl or if it's a boy. You know, that, that is important to us. That's one of the reasons we want uh, our male friends to help us raise the children. Um, we also feel good about the men in our lives. We feel that they are good role models. Whether or not there's a man around the house, Sarah and Lindy intend to provide a loving home for that child. Co-founder of Ms. Magazine, Margaret Sloan, juggles several roles, feminist, author, and mother. She realized her lesbianism during her marriage. The man I met, who later became my husband, um, was a pretty decent person. I think that he, like so many other men at that time, and still now, wanted somebody to not be an equal, and, and was very threatened during the, the time of my growth and my coming into my own self. You know, I was, the, I was a typical wife. I mean, he worked, I had the meals waiting for him at home, the house was clean. I think that my understanding of my sexuality was just a logical pro progression after I start feeling good about myself as a woman. My first sexual experience with a woman uh, was in 1968 and she was a nun. And, um, I was not ready for that. Uh, I thought it was a special friendship, uh, and she was leaving the convent and had been in for many years. Uh, I don't think I was ready for that at all. I thought that lesbians were kind of seedy women who wore dark tights and, and whose fathers or husbands beat them. They were miserable people living in the twilight of the, you know, the world. And I had no idea what lesbians were. I had all the stereotypes that we all have, unfortunately. I think I'd come to the realization before actually having the sexual experience, things started clicking for me and coming together. And I just knew that changes were going on in me. Margaret's politics have led her across the country with feminist Gloria Steinem. The women's movement and the neglected issues of third world lesbians influenced her coming out. As a black lesbian feminist, I know the importance of seeing that the Equal Rights Amendment is ratified. I guess I almost felt that it was my responsibility to verbalize, to talk about, to come out because of the attitudes that surround lesbianism and the homophobia that exists and people's myths and misconceptions. And a lot of ignorance is just a white woman's thing. When you experience racism and sexism and homophobia, it's uh, very painful. Uh, if there was only one, it would be enough for a lifetime. Margaret's life is infused with politics and a 13-year-old daughter, Kathy. An estimated one-third of lesbians are mothers who must often battle the issue of child custody. Margaret has been fortunate in not having to fight the courts and in having an understanding daughter who has known of her sexuality since age three. One of her friends asked her why a lot, you know, why is your mother a lesbian, you know? And Kathy responded, why is your mother straight? 
Kathy doesn't tell all her friends of her mother's lesbianism because some of them may not understand. She decided not to appear on this program because she feared reprisal from her schoolmates. Kathy stresses that her mother doesn't tie her up and lock her in the kitchen cabinet, as some people may think. She says the fact that her mother is a lesbian doesn't imply that she will be gay. I'm raising Kathy many ways. In terms of her sexuality, I'm raising her to be open to all possibilities. Um, straight people assume I'm raising her to... Um, are hoping I'm not raising her to be a dyke, and uh, lesbians are hoping I'm raising her to be a dyke, some of them. Um, I'm trying to raise Kathy to feel good about what choices that she makes, but also to be aware of those choices. I was never aware of them. My sexuality doesn't have anything to do with whether there's food on the table, whether I can put a roof over their heads, or whether I can just give them the love that I've always been giving them. I think the most important thing in raising a child is for that child to feel acceptance and love and support. Sally Gearhart punctuates her work as an author and speech professor at San Francisco State University with the same verve she has for her barbershop quartet. If she ever comes back to stay, there's going to be another brand new day. Walking with my baby down by the San Francisco Bay. Hey, hey. My mother's first response when I told her that I was a lesbian, although I think she had known all of her life that, that was true, I finally, at the age of 40, got up the, you know, the nerve to say to her the word lesbian. <clears throat> her first response was to say, why don't you get an operation? Um, she had... She was suffering under the very same stereotypes or myths that I think most of middle America suffers about lesbian and gay men, lesbians and gay men, and that is that, that there, one of them is that there might be something physiologically different about being homosexual. There isn't. It's a matter of erotic and intellectual and uh, emotional attachment to persons of the same sex. I did not uh, have any heterosexual sexual relationships until I was 38. And so I had a, a couple of relationships with some very good men who were good friends of mine as well and found that although I had a lot of friendship feelings for them, there was nothing like either the erotic or the intellectual or the emotional feelings that I had felt toward women. It was empty. I don't know when I first um, began to acknowledge any kind of feelings for other women. I know that all the time that I was growing up, I went through the standard business of, of feeling a great deal of admiration from my women teachers, you know. Went through a period of time of trying very hard to be heterosexual because that's the, that's the thing that you're supposed to do. I had been in a real deep, dark closet down in Texas for 20 years, and uh, when I came to San Francisco, it was, it was possible because of the women's movement and the gay movement that was just starting at that time for me to say out loud that I was a lesbian. I got so excited about being a lesbian that... Uh, I would even accost people on the street and say to them, uh, how do you do? My name is Sally Gerhardt and I'm a lesbian. Good. I got my tenure at San Francisco State as an open lesbian. And that was a change from my 20 years of being a lesbian hiding in the closet and attempting not to let people know, you know. A whole different atmosphere. All right, Maurice. Okay. Right. Lapa, put your head down at this end, okay? Uh, my being a lesbian went, it has nothing to do with my teaching. Um, um, I don't make any secret of the fact that I am a lesbian in any of my classes, but I certainly don't bring that to the fore uh, in an effort um, to make an issue of that. That's a misconception that this society, I think, has put upon women because there's no way that you can breathe properly when you're in a girdle. Sally feels that lesbians have been overshadowed by gay men and falsely portrayed by the same stereotypes when there are major differences between them in culture, lifestyle, and politics. I do not, as a woman, 
want to be misrepresented as what the what are the stereotypes of, of the gay male culture that there's a lot of casual sex which i do not think is true of most lesbians although certainly i'm not speaking for all here um, there is a lot of hyped up consumerism there is a lot of emphasis on youth and beauty things that women have been trying to escape from for years because we don't want to be defined just as young and beautiful those are fleeting things right and we have far more to us you know than that and to see our gay brothers latching onto that is is painful and uh, a high incidence of venereal disease, which in the lesbian community, the lesbians have the lowest rate of venereal disease of any social group in the United States. So that although I am in favor of supporting my gay brothers as they deal with these things, I do not want to be associated with those things because they are not my life. And I am far more like a heterosexual woman in both the way that I live and in the political battles that I fight then I am like my gay brothers, who are really more like straight men in many of those regards. I've had a number of painful experiences as a lesbian, um, most of them having to do with being hidden and closeted. I grew up a Methodist and converted later on to the Lutheran Church. I got very much into the religious aspect of things. All the time, of course, hiding the fact that I was a lesbian, all the time never realizing how heavy the church's oppression is on women. And I, you know, I see myself now with my, uh, you know, eternally looking for that, that, that great religious experience that was going to affirm my life. And so I had my Augsburg Confessions under one arm and my Bible under the other, and there I was on the plains of Texas with my knees eternally flexed for the leap of faith, and it never came. When feminism entered my life, I, I, I began to sound like a Geritol commercial or something, but when, when that entered my life, my life changed, and I found myself having the kind of religious conversion that I had looked for all of these years in the church and it had never, ever been there. Uh, you're trying to be honest and what you end up doing is living a lie because you don't want to be found out. Um, it's bad. It's really bad being uh, closeted. And I would wish for all the gay people and lesbians who are presently in the closet um, that they could find the strength somehow and the kind of support to be able to come out and to affirm themselves. But if they can't, there's nobody that understands better than I do why it is that they can't. Despite the increasing voice of the lesbian community, the majority remain silhouettes in life, leading double lives, fearful of losing their jobs. An empty bank account is more intimidating for women who are still at an economic disadvantage, earning only 59 cents to the dollar that men earn. An extensive network of closeted professionals has evolved, spanning Marin, San Francisco, and the East Bay. Few of these lesbians would consent to an interview, but this woman wanted to offer her story. It's uncomfortable to have, to be secretive, to have one foot in the closet, so to speak. I have to have two sets of friends, those who know and those who don't. And the reason I don't tell some of them, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't say a lot for them. So maybe they're not really my, my best friends. I think that lesbians are an invisible minority because there's no pressure on men really surrounding sex and not a whole lot of attention has been paid, I think, to what women think about sex. We're involved in other battles and women's rights and those sort of things. And so I think sometimes um, gay rights takes a kind of a backseat to that, even though it's just as important. It's too bad that I had to wait until I was 28 years old to really allow myself to have a sexual relationship with someone I felt in love with. And I think that's a lot of wasted time, and a lot of people have to go through that. When did I first realize this about myself? Well, when did you realize you were straight? I think it's, it's the same thing. That, that's what a lot of people don't understand. Um, 13, 14, puberty. It's from the beginning. 
it doesn't go away or change. It's just a coincidental difference. I remember when I was a, a teenager listening to music, the top 10, and all the songs are about love and romance and breaking your heart and all this sort of thing. And I knew those feelings. I understood those feelings. Um, I identified with the songs. Uh, it worried me at the time that I felt those things were the wrong sex. I think an awful lot of people are still closeted because there's this very contagious fear about it and, and we're afraid too. I think if I were going to give a message to the straight world, I would say, um, please relax and uh, give us a chance to relax because it's, homosexuality isn't a disease that's catching. It's, uh, it's the fear that's dangerous. Meanwhile, in another city, just about to go insane. Bum, bum, bum. Seems like I heard my baby the way she used to call my name. If she ever comes back to stay, there's only been another brand new day. Walking with my baby down by the San Francisco Bay.